Welcome to your backyard. This is my YouTube channel, and you have just entered the Sunday Coffee Chat Eat Your Backyard Yard Eat Your Backyard Zone. Okay, so let's get into it. In these podcasts, we check out where we're at in this food forest. Now, if you're new to the channel, I've been doing this for about 10 years now. And over that period of time, I have created a system that continues to evolve, which produces continuous year-round fruit, and also provides a beautiful space for my family and I to enjoy. And we love it. We spend a lot of time back here. We also have some animals that we love very much. The chickens and the bunnies which are both enjoying this beautiful weather here in eastern central Florida. I live not far from the ocean, and that's part of the, part of the ongoing challenge I have in having a food forest. And you'll find that you have an ongoing challenge where you are. It might be the same as mine, probably different. That might be poor soil, poor drainage not enough sunlight, too cold too long, too cold for some things, you know, too windy. But all these things can be mitigated. In my case, it's salt spray. Salt spray, which is a mist in the air that blows in from the ocean quite a bit in certain times of the year. Among other things, we get a lot of heavy winds, bugs, all those things. I'm not complaining, they're all part of the system. And actually the system we have here now mitigates those things to the extent that it's really uh, takes care of itself. Okay, so today, what are we going to, what are we going to do? Well, I have some things planned, but if you have something you want to look at or talk about, I would encourage you to participate in the live chat. I try to address all the comments, etc. You will usually have a couple of moderators hop on, which is always fun. And these things normally go on for about an hour or so. I think the record would be if we, if we went to two hours, that would be the longest ever. But let's look at, first of all, what's growing, what's growing on in the backyard. And let's eat some of that, because after all, this is eat your backyard, so I've got to eat my backyard. And people always ask, are you going to eat your chickens? And I'll, I'll just tell you right in advance, no, we're not going to eat our chickens. But we eat their delicious eggs all the time. All right. So what is growing? That's the first thing. The second thing is, after eating some of the fruit, is to see what are the new things that I planted and where are they at. I recently planted a mango tree that I have grown from pit. I have planted some mulberry trees I've grown from cuttings. I planted some new passion fruit, which I'd like to show you. That's an interesting new addition. I'm actually quite surprised at how well that's doing. And a couple of other things, namely sour tamarind, which I grew from seed. All right, so we'll look at all those things. And then, in addition, I even have a stretch goal of planting something today from a cutting. Get the, lop, get the clippers out and plant something. Okay, so let's get right into it. First things first, this is the, what we call around these parts, the Jamaican cherry tree. And if you had to pick just one thing to add to your yard, to start getting fruit all the time, especially maybe something the kids will like. They always say the kids will like this. Not all kids like it, but I find my kids like it, which are these delicious little berries. And you can see it is loaded. They, they are showering down if you let them, but we don't let them because we always pick them. Uh, what, let me see. Oh, there, there, it's hard for me to see what, there it is. Ah, the Jamaican cherry. And they're actually ripe when they just start to turn red like that. And they'll get more and more sweet the more red they become, but that is a Jamaican cherry. And a Jamaican cherry is something that is fairly easy to grow, as long as you don't have a freeze, and will produce nonstop fruit like this. There are periods of time where it kind of shuts down in the, uh, in the winter, I will say, but not for long. And I just recently fertilized this thing like crazy with bunny manure which is a great byproduct. That's why I got the bunnies initially, but now I enjoy them for their fuzzy goodness as well as awesome pets. We'll go see what Penelope the bunny, the lionhead bunny is doing here in a moment. 
but this cherry uh, is a reliable production tree that's really relatively easy as long you know all I feed it are bunny turds all right I'm gonna try it yeah I'd give that a, a strong 10 for flavor of cherries and I find it when you fertilize things with bunny manure they taste better call me weird but that's what I think and if you look around you can find more we're gonna pick this one for the chickens like I said they're just starting to come in if I look around I will find many more but there are just a couple all right let's go feed the chickens this is one of their favorite treats you can see I've got a relatively small backyard here this is why I try to encourage you to do the same all right my chickens know to come when I call chick chick Lucky chicken wins. Okay, so that's one thing. Now, figs. I'm looking in the fig tree. I've added many figs to my yard recently. This is the one that's blooming. Yeah, only juvenile figs there. Nothing, nothing ready. But let's go and look at this mulberry. This is a Persian mulberry. And I love these. These are like raspberry flavored mulberries, in my opinion. They're so delicious. Look at this. Big, chunky, chunky. Pick that. Oh, I love these. Now, I like them when they're red like this. They're just a little bit more tart. Let's continue to search. Ah, oh, here's another one slightly red and also benefit of picking them red like this is less likely for them to kind of explode in your hand with blackberry stained goodness oh look at all these future mulberries beautiful I'm kind of limited with the gimbal here but I'm looking around to see if I can find another one yeah two's all right two's all right yeah beautiful specimen of fruit really big compared to the everbearing and we'll go eat some of those too Big. This is a great variety. If you want a good tasting mulberry, I'd recommend it. All right, I'm going to try it out. Mm. Again, I'll give that a 10 for mulberry goodness. All right, EHC, first comment. Thank you. Took years to grow passion fruit from seeds, took two more years to get a couple of fruits, and Gulf fritillary butterflies decimated it every year. Took me three years to get rid of it. Really invasive. Oh, man. Jeez. Well, uh-oh. I might be into an invasive passion fruit experience here. Yeah. Won't be the first time. Well, first time for passion fruit, but won't be the first time of inviting a guest into my yard and having them never leave, like the famous... Mexican petunias, which we have no more Mexican petunias in my yard now. Why is that? Well, we do, but every time they come up, a hen will go and eat it because they love to eat Mexican petunia. I didn't realize it was delicious, so it, so it was a problem that solved itself. I'm hoping this does not become the bane of my yard, but, you know, let's give it a try. Here it is, passion fruit. Look at that. That's $13. $13. At Lowe's, twelve ninety nine. Yee wee! All right, look at this. I'm trying to hold this Monster Energy drink, you know, because after all, the natural energy apparently wasn't enough. All right, yeah. Hmm. Where do I place it? Yeah, I need to get this kind of growing up the side. The idea is we're just gonna let this thing go. Well, I'm gonna. I might tied up with a little piece of string, but I'm gonna let it grow up on here. Our, our yin yang symbol got absolutely decimated by the storms, but I didn't really want it here anyway. I, I want it in a different spot, so I'm gonna rebuild it and it's actually gonna be really weathered. I've got the other pieces inside. Okay, Odom's Homestead, 
Good to have you on. Thank you. I appreciate it. Good to see you guys. Now, good morning. Good to catch you live again. Yeah, it is good. We should communicate more. Look at this. Holy moly. It's a rabbit. Hey, Penelope. You giving me bunny butt? No, you're a sweetie. Well, I know what you want. You want to get out into the yard. We let our bunnies run free in the yard. Which, if you know bunnies, uh, it's incredibly interesting to watch what they do. Of course, you have to be kind of careful that they don't uh, become dinner for a hawk, breakfast for a hawk. So, But with me out here, that's very, very unlikely. I want to draw your attention to one thing. This is a Dracaena cutting that I planted. You might be familiar with like Lucky Bamboo that you, you see in a department store. They the stuff called Lucky Bamboo. Well, this is a type of Dracaena. Lucky Bamboo is not bamboo, it's a type of Dracaena. And you can see how readily it sprouts from the cutting. Look at that, that's just a stick jammed in the ground. And you can see there's dragon fruit growing up behind it, which is snaking its way quite effectively up the thing. This is Florida Ivy, is what I'm saying. These dragon fruit tendrils growing their way up the thing. We're gonna see what this turns out to be. But uh, I would imagine it's going to be very green. Everything you see here is the result of a cutting that I put in, with the exception of that passion fruit, which I recently bought. Now, there's a little mulberry tree that I recently planted as a cutting last year, and it is now starting to take off. Probably has something to do with the bunny manure. Uh, yeah, their thing, that's such a great comment, Odom's Homestead. Uh, love things that are easy to propagate. Exactly. Everything that I have here has ultimately been easy, meaning it survives. And there, by the way, the salt in the air here is one thing. And look at this. This never stops for like, well, it stops, but it'll go on for like a week where we have these strong east winds. And sometimes they pick up to be 20 miles an hour. You know, we live by the ocean, so that happens. But it carries with it all the salt spray. So it's coming in by the air. And then it's also coming up through the irrigation in this yard. It dives salty water in the irrigation. So, because it's from a shallow well and the water, groundwater here is a little bit salty. So things which can survive here have to be able to tolerate salt, which is not many plants. So when they do, and we can find a way that, well, the bottom can, the bark can tolerate the salt, but the, the leaves can't. That's another one is to get things that, if you can get just buy them big enough that the leaves are above the salt water from the irrigation that you must provide, by the way, irrigation here, or you would never see this. This is only possible by artificial irrigation. Or, you know, and you can do that by having a rain barrel. That's a responsible way to do it, I suppose, or through a well or through, you know, whatever, city water. But uh, the reason I have this stuff here is because I'm providing it nonstop water. All right, let's see what else we can eat. This was, this was the idea. All right, we're gonna move on to the Suriname cherry. We're up to two things. And there we are. Let's see if we can focus in a little better on that thing. We'll focus in. Interesting, low light. Well, anyhow, there are cherries. Hopefully I can get one. That one looks kind of a gnarly cherry. and I'm not one for eating the gnarly cherry. I mean, there are those among us who would not hesitate to eat the gnarly cherry, but Yeah, there's one. All right, in order to do this, I must put down the... There we have it. There we have it. It's kind of a gnarly cherry too, but I'm gonna eat it anyway. Let your hair down, eat a gnarly cherry. They're quite delicious, I love Suriname cherries. Very easy to grow. Some people don't like the flavor of them. I really like it. It's almost like a spiciness to it in a weird way, but it's very sweet, unusual. If you're expecting a Bing cherry, you'll be disappointed. But if you just dive right into it, well, I think it's. I think they're great, and I eat a ton of them. When when they're ripe and fat, and this is a like I said, it's a gnarly one. Usually they're fat and plump, but this is the end of the crop. They most you know. One thing I like to point out is the cherry grass. Like you could have a hundred cherry trees. You just you know pull them out. I'm not going to pull it out. No, I'm going to pull it out. Yeah, there it is. That's a cherry tree. That's a nice cherry tree. Suriname cherry. And they actually grow great fruit from the seed, usually. So if they don't, chop it down, grow another one. They are plentiful. All right, let's give this a try. The pit. High propagation. 
high propagation chance. And I just think it's good to have things sprouting and growing in your soil. I mean, that's what happens in nature. And if, you know, I, I think that it adds organic matter to your soil. It, it uh, of course, does a lot of things underneath the soil where it connects with quite literally fungus systems that develop throughout your whole yard, bacteria and fungus, that are, you know, I think another layer that we got to keep in mind, which is to allow those things to kind of do their thing. I'm, I've been moving into the area where I, I leave wood on the ground and let the fungus grow on it and so on and so forth. And, you know, I think that's a healthy practice. And then you, you get to see, you know, the results. There's some fungus growing, fungus, mushrooms, and all, all variety of things. And it will quite quickly eat up anything you put on the ground. Like, look at this. This is a Robolini trunk, so this is an example of what I do. The yard will consume it. Uh, this was already starting to, you know, it was already kind of a rotten. Well, actually, it wasn't rotten. It was more, now that I think back, it was fairly solid. But anyway, this was about six months ago. Chopped this thing down, threw it back here. And look what it's look what it's become. Yeah, so I just put stuff on the ground and it gets eaten up because this is sand that we're on. This is sand, beach sand. If you look down to the where you can see the actual soil, it's sand. We're on a big sandbar here, so anything we have for organic matter, we provide. And that's why I have developed little systems like this. And this will give me a good opportunity to show you and maybe encourage you to start your own composting system. I found it to be a lot of fun. I didn't know if I would like it. And here's the, so we'll go into a quick, you know, what's up with the uh, composting system. And you can see if you, you know, maybe tell us about one you have or your, whatever. But the way I do the compost system is based on a, some videos I watched on YouTube, but they just use you know, a thing of wire, which you can get at the store. Uh, and I, I like this type of wire because it didn't have holes that were too big. And then you just attach it to make a hoop, put it on the ground, start filling it with stuff. Fast forward a year later, two years later, you've got this, some of the most rich and, and nutrient dense, wonderful stuff to put into your garden and around everything. So I, I end up putting it around everything. I put it around the trees. And uh, then we'll let the chickens out. They scratch it in every direction. But uh, yeah, so how many of these could you have? Well, I would say, I mean, how many could I have back here? It's really the question I'm asking. I'm th I've been thinking about that. I would say uh, I would like to have maybe a couple more of these. And the reason is I'm almost at the situation where I'm producing no yard waste meaning I'm not exporting organic matter from my yard. It's most of it, with some exceptions, is coming back in. Even this massive oak tree trimming project that I recently did where I trimmed my huge live oak, I realize it's a live oak now, live oak tree, um, and uh, had a t just literally tons of, of um, logs, and I've utilized them all. We didn't get rid of any of them, actually. And they're quite useful, not just as a border like I have here, this kind of eclectic, you know, deal. But also, I think they're quite useful for, oh, look at that little squirrel. You know, they're quite useful for a variety of reasons. One of them is they do produce an environment where all the bugs can thrive, where the bacteria, the fungus, and all the animals that come into our yard thrive. We don't drive off any of the animals. Luckily, we don't have anything that, you know, we've needed to do that. We've had the chickens attacked by possums uh, once and so on, but they defended themselves and... We let the possum just kind of go away. But uh, this yard is, by comparison to other yards, filled with creatures. I mean, there's always birds. And, you know, it's not surprising to know why. There's plenty of fruit. And you know what? They don't decimate the fruit for whatever reason. It's, it's uh, still plenty of fruit. All right, let's continue our quest now that we've stopped in compost alley. Let's continue. Oh, look at that squirrel. The squirrel's so tame. You see it up there? Okay, look at this. This is another type of mulberry, but first let's take a look at the comment from Odom's Homestead. Looks delicious, thank you, Odom's Homestead. It was quite delicious. Look at squirrels that go in hyper right behind me. Sorry, startled me. <laughs> uh, Odom's Homestead also said, can't grow these here. I have a couple of Bing cherry trees and Lappin's cherries. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah, where I grew up in the Northeast, we had uh, cherry trees, Bing cherry trees, and we had to 
pick, be sure to pick them the morning they were ripe or the birds would just annihilate them. But the most delicious, I'm envious. Wish I could grow those. You can't grow those things here because of the, uh, the, the no frost time. And they actually require, they require chill time to produce fruit. So you, they actually won't produce spring cherries here. All right, now this is a ever-bearing mulberry. And just to give you an idea, I just spent 10 seconds picking mulberries and I have many, many mulberries. Now these are quite delicious and they, they will quite literally bloom year round with some small gaps. But if you have a bunch of these, you know, four or five trees, you're gonna be getting them year round. And that's the key with a lot of things. Wanna grow a pineapple? How about you grow 24 of them? Yeah, because one pineapple at a time, that's a small spoonful of goodness, folks. Ooh, by the, so I'm gonna eat these. These are ever-bearing mulberries and they're quite delicious. Again, I try to pick the reds and the blacks because that adds a little tart to the very sweet flavor of the more ripe fruit. Wow, that's outstanding. Look at this. Now, you might think, oh look, a weed. But I'm really having a hard time applying the concept of a weed to my yard now because we have these animals. So, and I know that this weed is something that the chickens love. The bunnies love, especially the bunnies. And they will eat up every bit of it. Now it has some aphids on it. So rather than, uh, I'm not gonna feed it to the bunnies since it has the aphids on it. I'll feed it to the chickens. Because the chickens love some aphids. There you go. Look, it's like a, oh, look, they, they see the aphids on it. They're picking them off the ground. Aphids are, you know, you might view aphids as an invasive, you know, thing. It may certainly not good, but they're delicious to a chicken. You're not gonna have any bug problems where you have a chicken. <laughs> oh, got a piece. <laughs> oh yeah. Mm -mm -mm. Why is it so interesting to me to watch chickens eat aphids? Well, I think simply put, it's just that you see how the whole system connects pretty obviously, if you think about it just for a second, so. There you go. One good thing about zone 7A, I mean, yeah. Yeah, zone 7A is a cold zone. <laughs> I know that. I think we're in zone 9A here. We're in the subtropical, just in the subtropical zone. All right, so that is, let's count them up. What do we have to eat so far on Eat Your Backyard Sunday coffee chat? Well, we had the Persian mulberry, the Asian, the <laughs> Persian, the Jamaican cherry, the ever-bearing mulberry. All right, what else? What else is there? Oh, and the Suriname cherry. Yeah, everything named after a geographical location, you will notice. Now, what else is there? I'm trying to think if there's anything else that is good to go. We have no bananas this yet. This, our banana patch pretty much got schwacked by the hurricanes, but they're coming back. And you can see plenty of new growth. Now, why do I feel like they're gonna come back for sure? Well, you might notice the piles of bunny manure and compost I've placed around them. That's what gives me the confidence. They'll grow great, produce delicious fruit. You also see a sugar cane growing out of there, which we have a few varieties of sugar cane growing around. And of course we grow that in the bunny run as well, because they love it. Recently transplanted some things. We're trying to revive this area, put down a bunch of potting soil I had actually on the ground and uh, trying to keep it watered. I had a Cavendish banana patch here, but I've removed it. I moved it over to here. It really wasn't doing well for whatever reason, probably because of the sprinkler water hitting it. So I've got it farther away from the sprinkler source and trying to regrow there. I'll hit it with a bunch of bunny manure. Uh, the hurricanes bent over this Jamaican cherry tree, which I grew from seeds, and also tore a hole out of this one that uh, I both I grew both of those from seeds, but yeah, that's all there is really for fruit right now are just those four things, but four is a lot. You know, four is four more than, is four more than I had when I moved here many, many years ago. 
and you know, transform this into a, a production place. All right, let's take a look at some other things. This is a Celeste and that's a classic fig variety that grows well in my area. Uh, it's starting to just now perk up. I expect these to have a period where they are somewhat dormant and grow their roots and took that period and is now, looks like it's doing quite well, starting to really show some vigor and uh, I've been fertilizing it with the manure, etc. I've also planted a lot of this spinach stuff around everywhere. It's a, it's a leafy green thing that grows quite well. You can see it growing back in there. And the more of that stuff we can have growing around, the better because I'm going to be, I feed that all the time to the animals. So I want to just utilize as much of the open space as I can with those ground covering type things and heavily harvest. You can see that the Moringa tree is bent over from the hurricanes as well, but doing quite well. And I'm pleased that along the trunk of the Moringa, multiple shoots. This is a great, again, edible, green that you're growing in your yard, uh, which can easily be utilized to feed to the animals or to eat yourself. Uh, they call it the longevity tree because people that if you eat this, you extend your life. And it's a uh, certainly interesting claim. I think it probably easily uh, agreed with from the, of, well, if you're eating something that has approximately the caloric and nutrient value of, of fresh broccoli, you are going to be healthier in the long run. That is easy for me to agree with, but I don't like the taste of it. It tastes like horseradish, so yeah, I guess there's ways to choke it down, but there's lots of other things to eat. <laughs> but these animals, we eat it every time. Look at that. Do they like it? By the way, chickens, these chickens are picky chickens. Chicky pickings? Chick chicken pickings. I do that on my guitar, I do some chicken picking. By the way, if you like music, you wanna hear some Jedi chicken picking, you should go to my music channel and subscribe right now. It's only like 270 or so subscribers, but that's where I post all of my original music. I play guitar and I keyboard and program drums and create all kinds of music and you might like it. I hope you go subscribe there and check it out. Also, I do a lot of guitar stuff like guitar modifications, talk about gear, stuff, stuff like that. So if you like that, go subscribe to Jedi Jingle Maker, all one word, Jedi Jingle Maker. And there I am the Jedi of Jingle Making. There you go. Not the Jedi chicken feeding. Although I like that also. Okay, so now that we're over here, I wanna show you something else. This is an update on my palm tree growing. Um, Chinese fan palm, doing quite well. Arica palm, doing quite well. And also my, my Robolini is doing quite well. So all, all of them are thriving. And you know, the key to growing palm, I always like to get this out, evangelize palm growing. It's not that hard, but you have to understand how to propagate a palm seed and that's to pick it fresh and ripe. It's gotta be ripe, fruit around it ripe lay it on top of the soil and keep it watered in a semi sunny spot and you will likely have success. Maybe partially bury it. And that's how, you know, most coconuts are planted. They just partially bury it and it grows, but it's on the surface it grows. So if you bury your palm seeds, although you may have some success, you'll have far more if you follow that simple advice. Yeah, so this is a dwarf coconut tree and those of you who have been on the channel for a while know that it's much bigger now than it was when I planted it not that long ago, but great variety to have in your backyard, uh, dwarf Malay. Looking forward to the coconuts. You might ask, when can we be cracking open a coconut on each your backyard? Well, I'm gonna say within a year or so, not from this one probably, but I have a few more that I planted in my front yard that are doing quite well. And I think I'll, uh, I'll be harvesting from them rather soon. They, they produce very quickly compared to regular coconut trees and they produce great fruit. So one thing you might think as well is a dwarf in every way and it isn't. It's dwarf in terms of how high it gets. It's not dwarf in terms of how wide it gets. So this is a big tree, but that's okay. Unfortunately, one of the main drawbacks of my approach here is that I did not correctly estimate the width of a hammock. <laughs> now I wasn't even intending it like that at all, but that would have been cool 
if I could have just strung a hammock. But instead, I've decided I'll have to. Once it gets big enough, probably place a post right here and um, string the hammock to that. Now, I want to show you something. See that little thing waving around in the breeze up there? That is a wind gauge I made. <laughs> it's just a piece of light plastic tied on to a very long piece of bambusa multiplex grown in my front yard. And then a couple of zip ties to the fort. And why do I have that? Why, why do I care? Well, I also surf. So, and the surf is right down at the end of the street. So now I know if the wind goes offshore, I'm on it <laughs> most of the time. But today, not onshore, not offshore. Today, onshore, it looks like victory at sea. We got north windiness happening heavily, which we also love. It makes for a nice cool day. These are the last of the cool days, cooler days. When I say cool, it's probably going to be uh, in the 80s today, but that is way cooler than what we're getting ready for here as summer approaches. We can expect, you know, 92 degree days to be the norm, not the exception. All right, so let's continue to look. This spinach stuff, my dental, my dentist, uh, dental hygienist there gave me cuttings. She watches Eat Your Backyard and she gave me some cuttings. And look at this. It is growing like gangbusters. This one, I've been taking lots of cuttings off the side. And you can see everywhere I take cuttings, it just comes back. She was like, oh, this is great. And it's edible. It's delicious. We eat it, etc. And it is. It's great. So been eating it. The chickens, the rabbits eat it. Everything, and I'm planting it everywhere because it grows well. It'll take the salt. Who would have thought? So it also will take the drought, which we had about a month of no rain. And that's a long time to have no rain any, by any measure. And if then if you measure it by the fact that we have, you know, sand which just turns to beach sand no time. It gets so dry so fast, nothing to hold the moisture. Well, then you're in for a, a tough time with some things. We had, you know, lawns dying, of course, every, everything, uh, you know, plants dying. But the things that make it through, you know, oh, these are troopers. Hey, Bobert Kronos, good morning. Welcome to the stream. I appreciate you. Thanks for leaving a comment. Don't hesitate to uh, let me know if there's something else you're curious about as we walk around and check out what's going on in my little food forest here in central Florida, subtropical growing zone. And as we pan left, we behold mangoes everywhere. Mangoes. What is going on with all these mangoes? I've been hearing them hit the roof, by the way. We had windiness. Just here, mango after mango pelting the roof, which wasn't great, but I tolerated it. And here's why. It's not the mangoes that hit the ground. And this is what mango trees do, by the way. They drop a lot of mangoes that they're not going to set fruit on. So how many mangoes can a mango tree produce? That's a finite number. And the mango tree alone knows what that number is and manages that. And that's why it drops all these fruits that it's decided to not. Now, you could eat these fruits. You could pick them up and counter ripen them, and they taste great. So they are viable mangoes. We don't. We just compost, compost them. We'll collect them up in a five-gallon bucket and put them in the compost bin. But the mangoes that remain, the lone mango that won, like this one, you know, it's the same thing. Flower, mango flower, lived its life, had probably started with, and I don't like to mess around with this too much. As I started to do this, I could almost feel it cracking there. I don't want to, I don't want to mess around with the nutrient delivery system to this fine mango. This will be a fat mango that is probably, yeah, so much bigger than this, but gigantic. I mean, it's just a huge mango that will be along with many others. And look at all these things. Look at them. Some will have two mangoes. Like this one, I believe, probably is going to be two. But you typically don't see more than two or three. Uh, everywhere you look, there's mangoes. This is a Tommy Atkin mango tree. And high, high probability of all these mangoes setting at this point and just producing incredibly delicious. Now, when fruit. I'll be busting out the dehydrator and dehydrating mangoes like a fiend this year to try to save all this stuff because they come in and man, there's a lot. Right now they're just little babies, but soon they will be gigantoids. And as they get to be gigantoids, like softball, bigger than a softball, 
they will be pulling those limbs down, which is a, you know why you get these limbs that are growing out more horizontally. And uh, I like to allow that to occur. Now, the next thing is though, this year I've got to do a trimming on this and the time to trim a mango tree is immediately after you pick the fruit. And you wanna give it the maximum amount of time where I am to grow back before it gets cold again, but also that's when it's gonna to wanna to naturally shoot up with growth. So pretty easy process, but you have to have the, uh, you have to have the, the intestinal fortitude to trim that sucker back, even though it's a sacrifice. You're probably sacrificing a year of fruit or something on a certain level. But if you don't, you wind up with a situation like this. Look at that. See, there's nothing but blue sky. That was a gigantic, probably 50 foot tall. I might be exaggerating, it might've been 40. 40 foot tall mango tree, it's just too big. And it was unpickable and it was right next to this power line and I hadn't managed it, so I had to top it, which is why you see the, the trunk down there. And then, you know, this is suboptimal. I left this one branch on it just so it could continue to to have nutrients to grow the rest of it, and that turned out pretty well. I've been feeding it nutrients too, but you can see it's it's re-sprouted everywhere, and now it will, will produce fruit in a uh, fashion where I can pick it, and I can manage it away from those power lines and not have to have a negative situation, especially when the hurricane comes, because that's when you don't want to have the 40-foot mango tree right next to your power lines, let me tell you. All right. So, this is struggling to make it. Good example. I'm sure you have things in your yard that are struggling to make it. If you do, go ahead and leave a comment. Let me know what those things are. Also, by the way, comment in the future. As I make these videos, it's cool where people can be a part of the live stream. And, uh, and I love that. That's an exciting thing for me, especially I, sometimes I'll see people I haven't seen in a while, like Odom's Homestead. And then uh, also, there are many, many more views after the stream. So, you know, we have thousands of views afterwards. So if you're watching this, in the future, I would encourage you to leave a comment. I, I try to respond to comments, and uh, we talk about a lot in these videos. So we're 37 minutes into this live stream. So I appreciate you with me. Thank you. Don't forget to subscribe, like, all that good stuff. Turn on notifications. That way you'll be notified as these things come out. Now, look at this. I just observed this. This is swarming with bees. My wife's been telling me about, about this because she picks the fruit all the time to feed to the chickens. And she said, there's so many bees. It's like a swarm of bees around, and it is. The bees at one point were so heavy here. It was like a swarm. That's so great to see, by the way, to know that there are pollinators around here because you wonder how they survive or where they would be in a place that's so urban. I mean, there's not really a suburb and there's not really any, a lot of natural spots, for, but apparently it's a happening. So grateful for that. Curious how, that's, how that is so plentiful. But here they have a thing to eat and they have many flowers, nothing but flowers. These Dracaena had been blooming recently. I mean, just insane amount of flowers, an insane amount of bees around all these flowers. And it's pollinating everything else too, pollinating the fruit, pollinating the shrubs, pollinating everything. The fruit and the shrubs. It's just not the fruit I eat. Chickens probably eat it. Yeah, but this is a sweet tamarind. It really got schwacked by a number of factors this year, so it's still alive, and I think the reason it's still alive again, what's the theme? Bunny turds. Uh, look, literally, there's a heaping, he, heaving pile of bunny manure at the base, bunny manure cam, at the base of this tamarind, and that's my, that's my solution to 90% of the problems in my yard. Should it be more complicated? I suppose it should. I also put a big old pile of compost, fresh compost that was just like laden with huge earthworms all around there. So that was pretty cool. The chickens, of course, came and scratched it out because we'll let them out to, to do, the, do the composting for us. But you also, if you let chickens out, they're going to also be eating up all your fresh grass. So you can't really let them, you know, free graze or you'll have a chicken pen for a yard. So we almost, now we try not to let them out unless we, we need them to do a job. And then you can kind of herd the chickens to certain spots, but... If you put around, if you put around, um, you know, four or five shovelfuls of compost around these trees, there's nowhere else a chicken wants to be. They are drawn to that like a moth to the flame, and they're going to scratch and peck at that until their work is done. They'll probably just continue to scratch at it because of how much they love it. Yeah, bunny turd. Thank you, Bobert Kronos. I totally agree. Bunny turds, nature's fertilizer pellets. They really are. They're not toxic. These are vegetarians, so. 
very easy to um, very easy to use their manure, their manure on just about anything. Uh, unlike, you know, if you were to use, like, say, dog manure, that can be very toxic because of the fact that you eat meat and there's E. coli and all this crap. So it's great. It's amazing. And, uh, you know, you can have big bunnies. I have bunnies that are not that big, lion head bunnies. But uh, when I do it again, I'm going to get really big bunnies that produce even more fertilizer because um, it's such a resource. I mean, it turbocharges everything. It really does. Uh, and, again, this is just a system of... So we have multiple systems at work here. The composting system is a huge one. The bunny manure system is another one. I used to have a worm farm, found I didn't need it. I found that my worm farm is basically the compost bin because let me tell you, both I harvested these two compost bins recently. This one I've started to refill. That one will be stacked to the top times. It just, and it will just compress down and compress down over time. That was halfway filled. Uh, two weeks ago, now it's just compressing down with the water. Rain has happened on it, and it'll just continue to compress. And I'll add, I'm going to trim up this shrub line here, which is my eastern-facing shrub wall. I'll take a quick look at that so you can see what I'm talking about. As you can see, this is a Dracaena shrub wall that I've grown over the years. This is a, another Persian mulberry here. but um, And this serves a very important function, which is to stop... Oops, hold on. Gimbal went crazy all right yeah that's better yeah so it's a very effective shield of salt spray these leaves are are very leathery shiny ovate and are very effective at blocking winds privacy whatever and i've got a couple varieties here so the thing is though it gets to the point where it's now growing into these power lines that are above it and that's no good so we we trim it back and that produces a lot of trimmings goes right in here. Just chop it up small enough to fit. And let let nature do its work, including gravity and water. And now this low quad tree, ah, here's a good example. Looks like this blew off in the wind. Now this, this is actually an excellent cutting. Really excellent, but since it's curved or whatever, yeah. So where, where does it go? Right in here, right next to the flowers that we bought at the supermarket. We're going to get everything that we can to put in here. And uh, here's another interesting practice, which is just lay it on the ground. These are loquat branches that I, that I cut off. That is part of a project. I'm gonna, I'll show you the, the tree. I'm not done yet. But these leaves, they turn brown, they fall off, they create soil here. And the more stuff I can just pile here and pile here, eventually I can just take out these branches and, you know, take off whatever additional things are and then take these sticks and lay them on the ground. And it's a pretty easy process and that way you turn the whole thing back into soil. Here's the loquat tree itself that I've trimmed just part of it away but you can see it's getting up close to those power lines and you know, those are actually fiber optic lines along the bottom there so it's not a danger thing but it will be as it gets up to those 220 lines just above it. So we're going to take this whole thing back and you can see I started to to top it here and there. It will sprout vigorously from that. This is the kind of tree that doesn't mind that. And uh, as a testament to that, I can show you, it's already happening here. It, it'll actively, there you go. It'll actively grow new shoots without much help. But I'll, of course, once again, hit it with the bunny manure, which it's time to harvest some of that. And of course, all the chicken bedding goes in here too. Now again, it's all connected. All these systems connect. And then we have the chicken system, which is another source of organic material, but specifically carbon, wood. So from the chicken manure, from the chicken coop, what we get is carbon, wood in your compost. And that's important um, to making good compost. And of course you get all the, the chicken manure in it, right? So we clean this out about every week and uh, in goes a new a new bunch of wood shavings, so pretty cool. And then again, it just compresses, compresses. We put layer after layer. Whatever we cut down, it goes in here. We try to not put anything in the yard waste because not for some um, some lofty idea, but the the real idea of not putting stuff in the yard waste is because why would we sac Why would we give away that nutrient value? Why would we give away that material that we could so 
easily and, and, and get so much satisfaction out of just turning it back into that. And that's, that's the next step, which is this beautiful, black, rich compost just overflowing with worms. Now, what is the effect of having a full-on worm farm in your life called a compost bin? I have no idea. But I will say it's probably good. Seems good to me. Hey, Big G. Good to see you. Good morning. Stoked to have you on the live stream. Yeah, so we ate about four different things. We uh, took the status of many trees, and there's much, still much, much more to do. If you're curious about anything going on back here, please do not hesitate to uh, leave a comment, either now, if you are on the live stream, just the group we have here, or in the future, in the comments. If you have an idea, come back, leave a comment, question, whatever. It's all good, all good. Um, we're going to look at this. Volunteer, volunteer. Volunteer for something. That's what we said to the papaya tree, and here we have it. This is the result of, I actually tried to grow carrots here, which I have a lot of success, but we had the chickens get out a couple times, and well, they ate all my carrot sprouts, and who could blame them? But you know what they didn't eat? The most disgusting flavored papaya sprouts. These are little papaya trees. They're growing here, and they came from papaya, which just fell on the ground, From this, papaya tree. You can see this, this is a leaning tower of papaya tree. It is leaning. And look, you get, the wind is showing you why it's leaning that way. That's what the wind consistently wants to do. It wants to push everything. But it pushed it. But so we got now easier to pick papaya. It's, it hung in there. We had a bunch. We lost about four of them, giant ones like this. I kind of like this. I'm going to show you this. Look at that. It's gnarly. It looks like some alien... Look at you checking. What are you doing? Let's see if I get a treat. Yeah. Oh, there's another thing. That's a dreadlocked croton. Isn't that cool? I love crotons. Another beautiful component in any yard, I would believe. I mean, look, what's going to give you, in any subtropical yard, what's going to give you this kind of experience in terms of a leafy thing you could grow? <laughs> it's insane. It almost doesn't look real. So many colors. Big G says, I just planted a manila mango. What are they like? What kind do you have? Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I'm not familiar with the manila mango, but it sounds delicious because it says mango. Uh, I have a Tommy Atkins mango, which is by far the easiest mango to grow in Florida. The most plentiful, easiest bug condition resistant mango I could possibly reference, Tommy Atkins. And then this is a Hayden, which is an incredible flavor uh, mango, classic, you know, good tasting mango. Decent, uh, decent fiber content to the mango. And then, which I like. And then there is this, which is the Edward mango. And this one has never produced fruit for me, even though we continue to tolerate its existence in our backyard. And then I planted two more, which was um, a Fairchild and, and a couple others, but they're both just struggling to survive. Fairchild, and I forget this one, it was another, the Queen of Mangoes is what it was called, and I forget the name of it, I have to look it up, but look, it's struggling to survive, and that's because it's getting the, the sprinkler irrigation on it. We're just hoping it can, it can outgrow that, which is again my bunny turd pile right next to it. <laughs> Now this is one I grew from a seed from the Tommy Atkins. Now why are we growing a mango from seed when there's not 100% assurance that it's gonna produce fruit like the, the original mango? Well, because what I plan to do with this one, and look at how vigorously, it's not affected by the salt much. I mean, it's affected, it's burning the leaves, but it is growing through it somehow. And that seems to be what happens with stuff grown from, from uh, seed. And you can see it's burning the tip, but it's still pushing through. Now once it gets to a certain size, what I do is, oops, sorry, my audio thing fell off my gimbal. It's so complicated. What I'll do is I'll graft on the original Tommy Atkins, which it came from, onto it to then get a high fruit producing tree. So that's a trick. Grow things from seed to form hardy rootstock, then transition them to a variety that produces 
copious amounts of fruit. Now, here's a good example of a, another tree grown from a cutting quite recently. That's another Persian mulberry. Look at how healthy this thing looks. And also, you want to know what, what's going on? Here's what's going on. Immediate fruit. You know, how long, when do I get fruit? Got it. You got it right off the bat. Just started growing out of a cutting. You got fruit. It'll give you a couple to sample it and know you love it. And then you'll just take care of it. So, yeah, I've got to tie it up a little bit more to the stick. I do kind of want it to grow up as much as possible and not just trend towards this open sky here too fast. Do a lot of shaping in my trees. But again, hardy, fruit producer, wonderful. Hey, this is a somewhat big tree, but I look at it more like a shrub because I'm going to continue to trim it back. The more places where I trim it, the more fruit it produces, and so on and so forth. So we don't let it get high. We just trim it on the regular. And that produces a reliable fruit crop every year as well. And then we manage the shade. So look, it's being overgrown by this tree. I can very easily trim that back. So making those trades to allow everything to fit in. If you look at, because there's only so much sunlight and you got to manage that. And that's why I do in this yard. And you can see I took out this whole area that used to be all green. If you look back in these other Eat Your Backyard videos, but now it is course that was managed but this central column of light that I have throughout my yard which runs north south so you know anyway it runs north south and and I really had to do that with the shape of my yard but we have this column of light that gets light all the time uh, at least once a day strong sunlight as the sun passes overhead what that gives me is the ability to grow grass which I really like we come out here and do a lot of like, you know, sports, whatever, throw the frisbee, throw the, the football, kick the soccer ball around, the, do the volleyball. So we do that around here all the time. And so to have grass is really nice. It's not as fun to play around in the kind of muddy sand. So that, this allows us to still have that. And, you know, despite the drought, it still kind of survived. I'm actually going through somewhat of a remediation of this, this area with adding all kinds of organic matter to it to get this grass to grow better. It is now. But recently, the chocolate pudding tree got schwacked by the east winds that we had here for several weeks and dropped a ton of, of leaves, which will cover up the grass and not be good. So I'll rake all those up, and where do they go? Into the compost bin. So it's all just like valuable fuel to the never-ending compost bin. All right, I'm going to show you how easy it is to grow this. And I did say towards the end we would plant something. Let's do that. This is, this is a type of spinach, they call it, but it, I'm sure it's not actual spinach, but well, oops. Well, it took a little bit more than I intended. I was just going to break it here and then the whole thing broke off, but no problem. Now we have two cuttings. All right. I'm going to take these and we're going to plant these. Uh, what I like to do is, and you'll see what I, here we go. Let's see, where do I want to plant them? I think I'm going to plant them over here, actually. Where those papayas were. When one thing goes, and just makes room for the next. Okay, so first thing is, take off these, these leaves. And the reason is, I will feed them to the chickens. And I found it doesn't need many leaves to get started, so yeah, that's about right. There you go. Oh, you know treats are coming for you. They like these leaves. They like any kind of lettuce, of course. And these have a kind of mild flavor to them, but that doesn't much matter to the hens. Oops, I got it. All right, this will, there you go. Good cutting, took off a lot of the leaves. Uh, let's go on this one. Now the key is to come back and water that. But why would I let this free chicken food go to waste? You could create a system where your chickens had everything they need just from your backyard, but that would, would require you to also provide them with the protein, so you gotta provide them with enough bugs. 
which is challenging. There are ways to do that. You can make a, like a basically black fly larva collection machine pretty easily. Uh -oh. oh, they saw that one drop. They can't quite get to it. Oh, man. <laughs> You hens are just getting nothing but fresh veg. And when you hold it for them, they can get a nice big beak full. And you can see what they're willing to peck each other for to get dominance over is stuff that they really love. We always try. Okay, can you hear me now? Hello? Mm -hmm. 